Okay, thank you everyone for joining us on our Wednesday webinar. For those of you who don't know, my name is Daniel Medina. I've been with Investors Advantage since 2006. We're going to start off today by walking you through our website. For those of you who have not been there, we post everything that we do on our website, including John's interviews. And today he was actually on Central Valley Talk, talking with Mike Briggs about financial planning. We also have our webinar schedule and post our past webinars. We send out web, our, the past webinar on the weekend. So if, if you wanna see anything that we've done in the past, please make sure to visit us on our website, ybpoor.com. We're also streaming live on Facebook. So please invite your friends and family to join. We've been around for 40 years and we're part of a larger group called Elite Financial Network, part of Securities America and manage about six, manage about $800 million. A couple of things that make us unique, we're, in, we're completely independent and we pay for independent research. One of only two advisors in the Conejo Valley that we know that do. And uh, now let me turn it over to John Grace. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and Daniel has a long history, started out in real estate right after Calu uh, with uh, mortgages and, uh, you know, to, uh, sells and buys. And that's how we came to, to know each other. And then I stole him away from the company that was uh, happy to have him. So I'm glad to have him. And he's the math man here at Investors Advantage. As you say, he's been with us for about 14 years. You may have come across uh, Jasmine Alvarado. She's on maternity leave right now. So we wish her the best. Uh, She's working up well. She's had just had number three uh, back just a week ago. So uh, she's a mommy of three and we wish her the best because you know, mommies have a big job and three of them has a big uh, conversation and a whole lot of obligation and responsibility. So God bless her. So we're gonna look at real estate and you know, real estate seems to capture people's attention. And I must say, it, it certainly captured my attention at a, at a relatively early age primarily because of my family. You know, they, these are African-American people who were building um, houses and building apartments. That just didn't happen back in the 60s. So it certainly captured my attention. Uh, we'll talk about what we've learned and uh, what most of us have been led to believe. And I think there's some distinctions there. So uh, we'll look at, uh, you know, our agenda is to look at what drives real estate, what I think is the fate of real estate, and I'm calling it a silver tsunami, which I think you will see uh, for good reason why that is the case. Uh, but um, I also wanna make sure that we understand it makes all the sense in the world to be as agile as possible. And sometimes we get so stuck in our thinking or the way it's always been. We think that the world is flat and there's no such thing as gravity. And then we wake up and find out, oh, it's different than what we thought. So to my way of thinking, it always makes sense to be flexible and agile and be willing to learn. And as Daniel mentioned, we've been paying for independent research and there are not many financial advisors who do. Uh, be, and, 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 what I, and, and the distinction there is that most of us, if we don't pay for independent research, we might say we have access to research, but let's understand if my parent company underwrites stock or looks at mergers and acquisitions, or you know, underwrites um, exchange traded funds, what am I always going to recommend to you no matter what? Not, now is a great time to buy. And that by the same token, if I carry a, a real estate business card, when's the best time to buy another house? That would be, oh, you have the money, that would be now. Let's, let's load you up. And, and I'm talking specifically to some people who literally loaded up on houses, but they do not see the big picture. So we're gonna, focus on the big picture, and then we're gonna drill down to look at some of the details in terms of some of the things that are happening right before our very eyes, but we don't have the capability to see what COVID, for example, how that little uh, event is upsetting the apple cart as we know it. And so we're delighted that we're gonna share time with uh, Tilden Machete, who is a real estate attorney, who has looked at some of these issues and, and, and gonna help us see what is right around the corner. We'll keep the big picture and then he'll drill down a little further to say, to help us see what is right around the corner and we'll be open for, for Q&A. And you guys always ask uh, great questions. We hopefully will provide you with, with re re really good answers. So uh, let's go right to work. This actually came from last week where the question was, what are the giant five stocks that I mentioned? And the reason I mentioned them and the reason I have this slide is because I think sometimes the slides tell the story. The giant five would be Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, and Facebook. And what part of the thing, part of what we're saying 
is there has been a bipolar stock market. In other words, what we see happening now is almost identical so far to what we saw back in 2000. In, other, in that time, it was the leading stocks were Microsoft, GE, Cisco, Intel, and Walmart that got to the highs. And then we see that there was about an 80% loss. Well, that's what happened then. And we think that could very well happen again. Uh, we're not making a prediction. We're saying, you know, we don't generally learn from history. We don't study history. We don't like history, but we should absolutely learn from it because otherwise I think we're destined to repeat it. But see what happened in 2000 and what's happening today is we're looking at the stock market in terms of its highs without recognizing is that, uh, is there a lot of depth there? Is there a lot of volume? Is there a lot of breadth? That's with a D, D-R-E-A-D-T-H. And the answer today is the same answer it was in 2000. No, we look at the highs and we extrapolate that it must be that all stocks are rising at the same rate and they are not. That is not a good sign. We want the, the uh, S&P 500 all to be rising at the same time. And right now, interestingly enough, with the, a very nice bull run, from roughly March 23rd through today, we see that, uh, let's see, I think it's the Dow that's still in negative territory. The S&P is barely in positive territory from January 1 through today. And the NASDAQ, I think, is up from a very nice 19%. Is this sustainable? We'll talk about that. But when you see the Dow and the S&P just barely holding their own and only the NASDAQ is uh, reaching for the sky, I'm saying to you that is not a fundamentally good sign. So we need to be prepared for things that could turn around uh, for, I call it the good, the bad, and the unforeseen. All right, so that's, the, that's from last week and appreciate that question. And I think that stock or that slide helps tell the story, both in terms of what we can learn from, from the past and what's going on today. Let's talk about real estate. As I say, I was blessed to have uh, you know, relatives who were buying in View Park, right? Uh, uh, got parents that were, he was a pharmacist other uh, uh, relatives where she was the realtor and he was the insurance professional and, and they did very well for themselves. So uh, you know, I had to, I would go to visit my godparents church and Aunt Bill would always say, hi, how are you? Are you saving money? Yes, Aunt Bill. Okay, you know, I'm a realtor. I'm going to buy you a house, but you have to be ready. Yes, Aunt Bill. And so I was ready at the age of 24. You'll see why that is interesting as we come about uh, to kind of see the whole story. But here's what we've been taught. And I would might say that it might be what we've been misled. In other words, we've been taught or misled that there are three primary things to keep your eye on when it comes to the prices of real estate. We all know them, location, 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 inventory, right? And then interest rates. Now let's pause with interest rates for a minute because see, in the early 80s, boomers would go to parties and the, and the primary conversation we would have in the early 80s is what have you bought? What house do you have in escrow? Did your parents give you enough down payment to buy the condo that you like? Okay, it was a rite of passage. Now recognize that 16% was the first trustee on many of those loans. And yet boomers were standing literally in line to buy houses really from the early 80s through, well, in fact, all through the 80s and it, and it got even more prevalent when we moved here in 1987, people were standing in line to buy a house in Three Springs. And that's what we did. And that's what everybody else did. And it didn't matter at that point, rates were down to 12%. But what I'm really, really trying to show you is interest rates weren't driving the bus. And in fact, if you told all of those people waiting to buy a house, you know, uh, in Three Springs, like you won the house and you don't, you just wouldn't qualify for it. Uh, but if you told those people that they would see 3% money, they would have thrown you out of that house <laughs> that they just bought and furnished. There's no way in the world that's going to happen. So notice we now have 3% money or better for 30 years. And notice you do not see people standing in line for houses like you used to see. Those days are over. And I suspect you will never, never see those days again. So let's get a, to, be, to a place where we're even more basic and maybe even, even a little more simple to be able to look at the situation in terms of what the primary driver is. And you know, when we talk about reading the economic tea leaves, uh, we've been paying up to $10,000 a year for independent objective research, which we have found to be very useful to help see the big picture. 
And if you ask me to identify what really drives the economy, I would submit to you it's watching the behavior of ordinary people, not the people you know. Those are the rich people, the educated people, ordinary people, the Homer Simpsons of the world, okay? Watch what they're doing. So when we look at uh, real estate, we can see that, let me, let me just begin here. What were you doing with the lights on at age 14 that you just couldn't stop doing? I got the answer for you. I know you don't remember, but it was consuming potato chips. 14, according to the Census Bureau, helps us recognize that 14 happens to be the age at which most Americans consume the most potato chips in life. I know I had to do it, Audubon, every day. Weekends, it was maybe two, three bags of Lay's barbecue potato chips. Could not live without them. So when we look at it from the buyer's standpoint, what we see is the pattern that 41 is the age at which most parents are buying the most potato chips in life for their, yes, you, you, you got it, their average 14 year olds. And once you move out of that space, you don't come back. I mean, you might buy some potato chips for the holidays, assuming we can have people over again, right? But that's about it. And, and I don't care the quality or the price or the origin, you've moved out of that space not to come back into that quadrant, which was so important at the time, but things have changed for you. And no one, no government, no entity, nothing, no product is gonna cause you to move into that, back into that space because you've moved on, you're, you're, you're done with it. So people are very predictable and we wanna think we're, we're very unique and we are, but we tend to do things in patterns. We tend to do things in groups. And uh, so it's not just as simple as interest rates and location um, and those kinds of things. It's looking at the buying behavior and the selling behavior of ordinary people. So let's go a little bit further. 31, again, this is the Census Bureau talking. We had just picked this up from the internet somewhere. Uh, we've been studying this one since 1999 when we started paying for the research and I find it fascinating. 31 used to be the age at which most Americans bought their first house. Now, as I say, I had a godmother and she was on me to buy a house and I thought that was the best thing since sliced bread. So I had everything lined up to buy my, my triplex uh, in Los Angeles at age 24, a little ahead of the, of the pack. But if you go back, you'll see what your age was and you'll feel like someone must have a GPS on your rear end because you were in that age range at that time doing exactly the same thing as everybody else around 30, 31. Uh, like I say, you know, mom and dad could help you with the down payment. You had a, a, an education, boomers. You had um, the drive to own a piece of property. So that's what you did. It didn't matter what you bought. You had to buy something and you did. Now, when we look at what's next, boomers can check off box one. 41 is the age at which, guess what? You bought your biggest house. And 40%, according to Dent Research, of all the homes purchased in the country between 1980 and 2000 were on lot sizes of one half acre to 10 acres. Does that kind of look like the Conejo? It kind of does, doesn't it? It kind of looks like most suburbs. Those were the boomers who could not live without a McMansion. And so for a 20 year period, we all thought we were doing something unique and we were buying the biggest house of our lives between 1980 and 2000. Again, 40% of those homes on lot sizes of one half acre to 10 acres, pretty large homes on very large lots typically. So boomers can check box two. So now what's ahead? Is it really all about inventory? Is it really all about interest rates? I would say it really isn't. It's about age and 78 is the age that most Americans do what? They sell all of the houses they have. Now, I really want you to understand this one, okay? Well, we're gonna go down a little deeper, but if you look at, you know, where did baby boomers come from? It's 76 million people that just literally came out of the woodwork. Now, you tell me, if there was a country, and there's only been one historically, that had 76 million people come into the equation is it reasonable to you as it is to me? The prices have to go up. So that's exactly what happened once in history to one country, the US of A. That's the only time that has happened and I doubt it will ever happen again. 
But I would submit to you that is, that is the primary reason prices are at these nosebleed levels. You have to build a whole lot of housing to accommodate all of these new people. And it may be not much different than what we saw with the tulip bubble. You might remember that one in history. This one, I remember history because of this story, you know, where from 1634, this is unfathomable, but this is history, with a tulip, a bulb of a tulip, you could buy an estate. What? <laughs> that lasted about three years. And then guess what? The air came out of that balloon. That balloon got burst and prices came back so that the cost of a tulip was about the same as a lemon by 1637. So my point really is that's the first indication for us to see, boy, when things get crazy, sometimes they get real crazy. And then guess what? We have to come back to reality. So I now let's talk about, you know, what do we see in terms of coming back to reality? Because we think that is that is absolutely in the cards. Okay. So how did we get here? 76 million people born 1955 to 1976. Uh, I'm sorry. 55 to 76. Yes. All right, uh, those are that 76 million people that comprises about, uh, I'm sorry, 46 to 64, there we go, 1946 to 1964, right here, right in front of me. <laughs> those, are, those are the right ages or the right years. That's when 76 million people came into this equation. Legal, illegal, legitimate, Ill, uh, illegitimate, didn't matter. You have to build to accommodate all of these people. So I would argue the primary reason prices are here is because of all of these people which causes me to look at what happens when all of these people go to heaven. It's logical to me that if it took 20 years for people to buy the biggest house, it'll probably take about 20 years for people to come out of their houses, whether they're walking out of them or they're being carried out of them in the mid eighties, but we're coming out of those houses. And if we wanna see a trend, we might wanna be at the head of the pack of cows as opposed to the middle, or at the end, because people will say, a friend of mine, you know, I've been in the business, real estate business for 40 years. I've seen the best of times. And I like to say, no, you've seen, I'm sorry. He says, I've seen everything. No, you've seen the best of times. You've not seen everything. You have never seen 24% of the population go to heaven. No one has. But in your mind, if 76 million people came into the equation, and as I say, it take about 20 years to go to heaven, and the same number of real estate building construction for all of these people, apartments, homes, stays the same over the last 130 years of construction. Where do you think prices are going? I think it's safe to think they might be going to hell, okay? People go to heaven, that means your demand is evaporated. Inventory remains the same, what has to give? At some point, we get back to supply and demand. And it would, to, to, to accommodate supply and demand, if the demand has gone away and the supply remains the same, typically what follows are a decline in prices. Now, the interesting thing about real estate is it's, it's almost impossible, if not impossible, to hedge. So either you get to capture that cash and redeploy it, or you do what we saw and we've talked about after the Great Depression one, and we see more recently in Japan, where prices in, in Great Depression one took 40 years in New York City, financial hub of the world, to get back to even. And more recently in Japan, prices seem to have peaked in Japan real estate around 1991. And they have those, I found an article that was written in 2017 that suggested Japan real estate prices would recover in 2021. That was before COVID, <laughs> but that was 2021. You mean the prices came down about 70% in 1990, 91, and now we're going on 30 years nearly, and the prices are not back to where they were? That's correct. That's exactly what's happened here in the US, it took 40 years, and so far we're just shy of 30 years in Japan, Prices are not close to where they were. By the way, neither are stock prices. So what that suggests to me, if those kind of events have happened twice, stocks first, real estate second, 
U.S. first, Japan second. What's in the cards as far as the future is concerned? All right. That's what I think. And when I ask uh, Harry Dent, the president of our research team, what he thinks, he says, look, start with, with Japan, but they haven't gotten back to even. Um, look at China. They, they did what most of the world did, which is get high on all the real estate they could possibly purchase. And apparently, I think in America, the average household uh, percentage in real estate is about 30% or so. But in China, it's 78%. At some point, these bubbles do burst. And when they burst, they're all connected. We might like to think we're exempt. The truth is we breathe the same air, we drink the same water, and we used to fly the same airplanes. So we're not exempt. So there will be, he submits, a chain reaction. Uh, China first, after Japan, right? They're still not back to even. Uh, followed by uh, Australia, very well tied into uh, to China. And then the UK, Canada, and the US saying do not be surprised to see prices drop maybe 40 to 50 percent from these highs all right so that's what i see from the big picture and i'll be happy to answer your questions let's bring tilden into the equation so he could give us a sense for what he's seeing right here right now particularly with uh, covid and the impact that he's recognizing how the laws are being changed and i, and I just want to put insert this what he's seeing may not be different than what we all saw with real estate prices after an earthquake. In other words, yes, it happened in Northridge, right? But much of Southern California, certainly all of the Valley was impacted negatively. Uh, even though it was you know, that far away and, and you lived in Encino, your house wasn't worth what it used to be worth for some time because all the houses got painted with the same brush. I think that uh, that is a good analogy for us to kind of recognize where none of us are exempt no matter where we live. Well, my house is different. Of course it is because you love it, but that's because you have an emotional attachment to it. And by the way, when people are thinking about what to do with their house, you know what they tend to do? Take about two years to figure out what to do with their house. Now they'll sell their stock and not buy a darn thing. But when it comes to the house, it's like, well, I really don't know if I want to do that. Look. The economy does not care about your goals. <laughs> Let's recognize that. So either you get the cat, the, the fish, or you tell the story about the fish that got away. Oh, Tilden. Let's see. I'm supposed to um, give this audience. Oh shoot, my um, your where did I put it? <laughs> well, 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 well. Uh, darn it, Tilden. Yes, sir. I have lost it. So let's see. I was going to give you your your beautiful background and your bio, and it's one one of these screens, and they're all looking the same right now. So Tilden is a real estate uh, attorney. Uh, you can fill in the blanks, but he works with high net worth uh, clients and family offices, and this is something he's been doing as a specialty for some time. Generally, people don't need a real estate attorney, but sometimes they do. Like we have uh, one gentleman who's thinking of, you know, I have this property where the basis is low, but I have that pri property where I inherited several years ago. It's kind of confusing, you know, what the tax impact might be, uh, but that's part of what uh, Tilden does to help people recognize here are the uh, ways that you might be able to look at your situation and address it today that might make some sense. But Tilden, please bring us up to date, if you would, on, on what you're seeing with the laws and what you're seeing relative to COVID upsetting the uh, real estate apple cart. Absolutely. Thank you, John. That was, that was very, very helpful and, and a really good uh, introduction to all the things that, that we definitely are starting to see. And well, John's coming at it from looking at it from the angle of, uh, you know, the silver tsunami, as he's calling it. Um, I think that's absolutely critical, um, especially uh, the, the part uh, he was talking about interest rates really resonated with me because there's been a lot of talk in the commercial world, too, about whether uh, whether interest rates are going to change uh, as, as interest rates go up, are people going to pay more for their investments in uh, in commercial real estate? And the answer is probably not that much. So uh, they should be paying, uh, if, if rates go up, they should be paying less because they're not going to net as much money. Uh, but they probably, at the end of the day, rates may stay the same as it relates just to the investment as a whole. 
Um, so as John mentioned, my name is Tilda Muschietti. I am a real estate attorney. I've, uh, uh, I come to the practice kind of with a unique perspective. I uh, not only have been helping uh, families deal with property tax issues or s selling houses or estate type issues. I also do a, a lot of commercial real estate as well. And I come to the practice also as a broker and a developer and a syndicator. And so I've had a lot of different hats. Uh, I also have a background in finance. So uh, John's uh, always extremely insightful. And so I'm very, very happy to be on a webinar with him. And so some of the things I wanna talk about that are affecting us on the legal front uh, may seem a little disconnected at first because some of the things I'm going to talk about are commercial related and really are going to affect your commercial owners. But it's that's that's a very narrow view if it's if if it's seen just as well that's commercial and it doesn't affect me because it actually really does affect it affects everybody. So. Uh, I guess the easiest example would be a uh, the apartment building. You're, everybody's competing for space in where they're going to be living. And so the, the, a lot of the equation that goes into people's heads when they're buying a house is what, what, is, a, what is a comparable rent going to cost? So as those rents change, that affects it as well. But also the how commercial real estate affects everything that we buy. I mean, it goes, it's factored into our, the cost of our food at the grocery store. It's factored into uh, our investments. If you're invested in REITs or you're invested in private equity or something like that, it's a lot of those are, are driven by commercial real estate. I really think of commercial real estate as kind of the in, a major engine in the economy. That's the places where people collaborate and people offer things and services to the world. Um, so all of these things are connected. But I think probably the most forefront on people's minds right now is, uh, is COVID-19 and what its effect is. As you probably, most of you probably know, we have a uh, eviction moratorium that's been put in place. And um, that came out of uh, an executive order from Governor Newsom. And it actually was enacted in March on March 16th, and it's now since been extended. So it, it extends now uh, through October. Um, and because of what the uh, so our government's divided up into three sections. It's divided up into the executive branch, which for the state is Governor Newsom, but it's also uh, the other part of it is the judicial branch. And so the judicial branch is overseen by the Judicial Council of California, and they set rules on how courts function. Uh, and the Judicial Council decided on April 6th that uh, they were going to take that eviction moratorium uh, that was allowed by Governor Newsom, and they were going, they said to all the courts, look, you, you can't even let the uh, eviction proceedings start until three months after the eviction moratorium or the eviction moratorium or the governor's orders have ended. So the very soonest we're looking at where an eviction process could start is probably December 31st. Now why that's important is it's it's going to be putting in a lot of, it's putting in a huge burden on your owners of your apartment buildings. And it's putting in a huge burden on the whole overall infrastructure of uh, our economy. Uh, and so after they did that, the local cities all came up with their own rules and Los Angeles is kind of, is kind of a leader in terms of the the breadth of their rules. So they've made it basically clear that, look, we're, we're, we strongly support this eviction moratorium. We're going to make sure that no tenant can be evicted. And uh, so, you know, all that all a tenant really has to do is give notice to their landlord that they uh, are having an issue or that their uh, wages have been cut. And I'm not saying that that was right or wrong. It's, uh, but the fact of the matter is that it's a fact that that 
is the current rule and constitutional or not that that's where we're at today until uh, the courts have a chance to overlook it and i know that uh, there has been some some lawsuits filed uh, by apartment owners to try and overturn that um, and it even more so it gives it gives tenants a what's called a private right of action so they can also sue their landlord not only for you know trying to ask for the rent but they can sue the landlord for saying that the landlord has been asking for too much rent so out of the woodwork is going to come uh within the next few months we're going to see a very very heavy uh, burden on the courts of these private rights of action, I would predict, where, where representatives of those tenants will be filing lawsuits against them saying they were overly pressured. I know I've gotten some calls myself from tenants wanting to do that. I only represent owners, so it doesn't, uh, I'm not the person that they should be talking with. Uh, but it's going to be putting in uh, a huge burden. Um, I think a, a great example of this and how it ties in directly with home ownership is I have a client who owns a condo in Santa Monica. It's near the beach, it's beautiful, it's huge, and it rents for $35,000 a month, which is uh, a lot of money. Um, uh, and the it is, it's the son of uh, the person who, who's the tenant is the son of a very, very major hedge fund manager. He is a, a billionaire. Uh, his son basically acts like a trust fund kid. And uh, so the tenant called up my client one day and said, we're not going to pay our rent. And so the landlord said, what, what, what are you talking about? You're not going to pay your rent. You know, what, why aren't you paying your rent? He said, no, my dad says we don't have to. And uh, so they're refusing to pay rent. So they called me up. The landlord called me and um, told me the story. And I had to tell them, yeah, uh, they basically can get away with that for a very, very long time. Now, they still owe the rent. So they still owe this money that's coming up, but they don't need to make uh, pay any rent, uh, any late fees. They won't need to pay interest. And that's because it's in Santa Monica. Santa Monica is very progressive in terms of how long that rent moratorium lasts. Uh, they're, they're in there till March at least. And uh, without any rent. Now, this landlord also has a mortgage to pay, and you know what's going to happen if they're if they're not able to pay their rent. We're talking about foreclosure, uh, which we'll talk about soon, and um, that will hurt as more and more foreclosures start happening. That's going to start hurting all of the homeowners that are near this property. Uh, so those are the sort of things that we're seeing out of. Uh, the un unforeseen consequences out of, of, of rent moratoriums or rent holidays or eviction moratoriums is that there's no teeth anymore. And if uh, the landlord even presses it too hard, there's a, the tenant can just sue him and they have enough money to be able to afford to do that. Um, so rentals are being heavily impacted. And this is also, this is your single family homes. This is that the home that's next to you that, that you know that the, the owner rented out and it's now vacant. And it also goes into that whole calculus that goes of, you know, what is a home worth? If my rent is $4,000 a month, maybe it makes sense to buy a house. But if my rent is $1,000 a month, you know, for a, for a house, why would I buy a house? It, it wouldn't make any sense. And those are the buyers of this property in the midst of the silver tsunami that's coming. So we are seeing a wave of foreclosures coming. We number of uh, people who've been put on notice of foreclosure is, is popping up and I've been getting in quite a few calls. Um, and uh, in California, we're uniquely situated as well as 
uh, a foreclosure is, uh, is basically when the bank says, hey, you haven't been making your payments. We plan on taking the property back. Uh, what many tenants what, or many owners try to do is they try to negotiate with their bank and do a loan modification. Now, California, in its infinite wisdom, in 2009 enacted Senate Bill 94, which said, okay, you can, uh, you can still ask the banks for a loan modification, but you can't use an attorney. You can't have an attorney ask for it anymore, and you can't have a real estate agent ask for it. You can't have anybody ask for it. You cannot pay anyone to help you with your loan modification anymore. Uh, this was a bill that was actually sponsor sponsored by many of the banks. And what it will probably do is loan modifications will not be happening uh, because banks like would rather deny them rather than grant them. And uh, so they can go to foreclosure and try and sell the properties, which will drive prices down because foreclosure sales tend to be at a little bit lower of a rate because really at the end of the day, the lender wants to get the amount that they've put in uh, and any surplus that they get is is pretty irrelevant to them. Uh, so there's other laws that are coming down the pike too. So rent control is going to be on the ballot in November, and what it what it really is it's not a uh, it's not a blanket rent control bill as such. It is a bill that's saying uh, there's a law in place called the Host, uh, Costa Hawkins Act which basically limits the amount of rent control that cities uh, can put in place. Uh, so those, that's up for the election on November 3rd. And it, I would guess my temperature is that it's going to get repealed, that the Costa-Hawkins Act will be re repealed. And I would predict that it's, uh, it's much more likely that rent control will come into place, which really puts more of a burden on on your landlords. It's gonna drive the prices of your rents down uh, be, and it's going to increase the amount of, uh, of difficulty for your landlords and they're going to, you know, so it just makes a home less likely to wanna to move into. Uh, more on the commercial real estate side is uh, the sp split roll tax that is also on an initiative on the ballot. That's proposition, um, uh, I think it's going to be uh, Proposition 15 is the new one. And what it is, this is the first chink in the armor that's been planned out to uh, weaken Prop 13. So this is your property tax, Prop 13 is your property taxes that they can be no more than 1.2% one, uh, 1 of your purchase price and then, uh, or fair market value, and then they can only increase by 2% a year. Um, so this is a, a, this one I wouldn't put, I would, I would say could go either way, it, it, but it is a, if it does pass, this is a major, major blow to Prop 13 that overall weakens it and probably Prop 13 would go away within the next five years or so. Um, lastly is uh, kind of an interesting bill I won't talk too much about. It's uh, Senate Bill 1410. This is a bill uh, that it's not on the ballot. It's up, uh, it's with the legislature right now looking to go forward to uh, the governor for his signature. And it allows landlords and tenants to try and work out a deal. Um, and if they can work out a deal, uh, if they can't work out a deal, but as long as the landlord made a good faith effort uh, to try and do that, the burden, uh, they get relieved of the amount that's owed by the, land, uh, by the tenant uh, in the form of tax credits. Uh, I forget what the amount that they're estimating that this will cost the state of California, but it's a, it's a very, very heavy burden to put on the state. It's going to, to cost the state a very large sum of money uh, if it does pass it. It, it probably will because it's the kind of thing that's very palatable for, uh, for uh, politicians to get elected again. Um, so uh, thank you. A uh, little bit about me. Uh, 
Uh, again, my name is Tilda Moschetti. Uh, Moschetti Law Group, we are a real estate firm. Uh, we do, we have, we represent only owners. So whether that's the owner of a home or a commercial real estate uh, or buyer of real estate or sellers of real estate, those are the people we represent. Most of the time, those are high net worth individuals, private equity firms, things like that. Uh, and we, we help those owners. So thank you, John, for having me on your webinar. And I'm hoping we get some questions too. Yes, we'll open up for questions. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to say again, folks, you know, there are a lot of ways with investing that there are hedging capabilities. With real estate, that's just not true. Either you get the cash or, you, or it's like the fish that got away. All right. So uh, we're saying, and in fact, one of the things we're going to send you are a couple of things. One from us in terms of how to look at minimizing losses uh, in, the, in the investment world. And another one that uh, Tilda and I were by, very impressed with from Realtor.com, Realtor.com, which uh, uh, gave, identified six great reasons to sell now. What I find very interesting about that, they did not get into the weeds of what to do with the proceeds. They just suggest this might be a good time to sell. And as I say, either we're ahead of the pack of cows and as an old Boy Scout, I can tell you that's the only spot to be in. Because if you're in the middle or the back in uh, New Mexico, either you get ahead of them or I want you to recognize it is absolutely true. The view and the smell do not change. And it is awful. So if you continue to be part of the pack as opposed to get your money off the table, I'm suggesting you don't have to figure out what to do with the money yet, but it might be good to have the money in your pocket, you know, and the popcorn in your lap. That way you can watch whatever unfolds, however it unfolds, without having any emotional attachment to, oh, I hope it gets back in time. Because like I said, the, the, the economy, the, uh, this, this, the economy does not care about your goals, does not care about your timing. Either you caught that fish, either you got that capital, and you can redeploy it in some other way at your discretion when you are comfortable, or you're sitting there wishing and hoping. And that's part of the reason we do this, by the way, is learning so much from the depression. I, the, the biggest um, nut from that, takeaway from that, is, is regret. Imagine your, your, whatever real estate you own went down 69%, took 40 years to get back to even. You were well dead before it got back to even, okay? Stocks, it took 25 years to get back to even again. Life expectancy for Americans born in the early 1900s was 57. So both your stocks and your real estate got crushed on your timeline and neither got back to their highs while you were here. I don't want anybody to experience that. So, uh, you know, I think there's a better way to play the game. Now, let me do two things, please. Uh, and then we'll open for questions and answers because something that really touched me, inspired me to make an announcement. Um, and this is from a, um, a show uh, on Sunday where it, it was a resident who wrote into the show at an Arizona hospital who tested positive after caring for COVID patients. He wrote this. I fear now more than ever for the safety of my family and the, and the emergency department. We will do everything we can during this pandemic to save you if you are sick, all while knowing that it puts our own lives at risk. It's not only our job, it's who we are. The one thing I ask of you is to think of us when you go out to a restaurant or meet up with a friend or decide not to wear your mask because it doesn't feel good. I don't know how long it takes to make an N95 or a vaccine, but I do know how long it takes to become a doctor. I was very touched by that. In fact, I reached out to this uh, physician uh, to say, look, you, you inspired me to do this. What we're willing to do starting today is a free financial plan for every person who's on the front line. Now, just to give you a sense of that, typically when planners do, plan, and many of us do not. From what I learned in, in, uh, at a conference in Seattle back in June, the average cost for that plan is about $2,000. So if you're a frontline worker, know of a frontline worker, please uh, spread the word. We will spend an hour at no cost obligation whatsoever to help folks do a plan because 
to me, it's all, as I say, my, what I want to avoid is regret. What I also want, but what I want is something that we can look forward to because it kind of, it, it pulls you to the other side. It pulls you through. And the only way out is through, as our psychologist uh, shared with us in one of our webinars a couple of weeks ago. So this is our effort to say we're, we're here as, as we can be here to help your family, uh, you know, uh, frontline people see that financially we can do the job so that you know you're being taken care of like you try to do such a good job of taking care of us. So I, I thought that, that reading that would be valuable now. And as I say, it inspired me, may it inspire you, and please feel free to share the word. All right, Daniel, what questions do we have, please? Very touching words, John. Uh, first question for you, John, are millennials buying houses? <laughs> Whoa, I love the question. So the, the, yes, this would be the correct answer. And yet, if they were to ask me what they should do, I would say this, keep your powder dry. Look, as I say, back in the 80s, by the time you closed escrow, whatever the heck you bought, closed at a higher value than you agreed to pay. That's not happening now. It's not happening because we don't have 76 million people turning 30, making good money and want a house. So what I would say is, if you don't care about your down payment or the mortgage payments you pay, I don't know when prices are gonna come down, but I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll tell you how far down they will come when we can get to that. But I think the odds are very high that you're gonna see, you're, you're not gonna close it profitably. And in two years, you may find that the price is significantly less than what you paid for it. Now, if that doesn't bother you, if the, if the equity that you have is um, uh, not useful to you, or you don't have any plans to redeploy it, or you just don't really care what happens to the house or houses that you own, fine, ride the roller coaster, enjoy it. But you, you, you don't really have uh, skin in the game. You, you, you must be doing fine elsewhere, that's great. Now, if on the other hand, uh, that doesn't sound like fun to you, I'm saying keep your powder dry, because I think prices are coming your way. And maybe it's, as they say, good to keep the money in your pocket, watch the movie, as opposed to making the purchases, doing all of the $30,000, dollars $50,000 worth of improvement you have to do when you become a, an owner, right? You have to do it as a renter, but you have to do it as an owner. If, you, if you're worried about that being gone, uh, then I would say, yeah, you choose. If you don't care about what happens to the down payment, buy away. If you do, I would say, keep your powder dry, see how this thing unfolds. I think prices are coming in your direction. Now, this is a little similar question that, that you just answered. As a real estate agent, is it best to inform clients to sell and hold onto their funds rather than getting into more property? If so, how long should they hold onto their funds and why? Yeah, um, I, I mean, you know, is it best? We don't know, do we? We can't see the future. I would just say that you're able to read what happens by a function of having the cash. For how long? I don't know. But if it is the case, I mean, we could, again, from 1980 to 2000, who saw boomers having to buy the biggest house in life over a 20-year period? Who saw that coming? No one. Boomers, I had to do it. I had to have a 5,000 square foot house, two and a half acres, but exactly at 41, early on the first purchase, exactly right, just in time, 1999, on the second purchase. But what I'm saying is, maybe you just have to watch it to see if you want to get back in. Don't be anxious. We're not seeing double digit inflation on real estate. So this one I think you can be more patient on from the standpoint of, as I say, might prices move in your direction? You can kind of weigh whether or not you want to get in the game as opposed to getting in the game and having regret. Because see, it's because of, the, 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 of all of these people, in my opinion, that have pushed these prices to these levels. I would submit to you, because once 76 million people are out of the equation in the US of A, I'm, I would argue you may not see these price levels again. And, and let's recognize so many of us bought the house because we knew that it was only going to go up. It was an investment. It, it was a way to use it as an ATM machine. And maybe it doesn't do that anymore, when, or certainly not like it has, when the number of people are not like the levels that they used to be. So I, I would say, you know, in terms of appreciation, 
it, it might, it's probably a, a, uh, a uh, emerging market country that I think may have uh, greater appreciation moving forward. As, as I say, from Harry Dent, uh, the decline he thinks is going to start in, it already started in Japan, has not come back. Next, he thinks is Australia, Singapore, uh, spreading to the UK, Canada, and then the US. So uh, we'll see how it unfolds, but you know, no one has a crystal ball. And you know, a lot of times what, what I see from individual owners that own real estate and they rent it out is they don't do the math. And I'd love your opinion on this, Dylan. They don't actually do the math to see what they're really making on the properties or what their return is, either a cash on cash return or any return. They just kind of, they just buy it, rent it, and whatever they make, they make. And in, in our world, that's, that's the last thing you want to do. You want to, you want to know what you're getting into, what your return is, and when to get out. Yeah, that comes from the old thought of, well, prices are always going to go up 5%. So look, I can, as long as my mortgage gets covered, I'm making 5% of my money. Um, and, uh, that only that math only works when it goes up. <laughs> right, right, and, and no one. What I see is no one actually does that math. So I, I, I find it hard to talk to people sometimes because they have no idea. Well, we don't uh, look at history. We don't do the math, as you say. We we only expect rents to go up. We do not imagine. I my first property was a triplex. I I was a landlord. Right. You expect rents to go up every year. You have not had the experience of prices and rents going down or plateauing for longer than you imagined. And, and the way we work a lot with uh, aerospace engineers and, and their logic is don't give me the sales pitch. Show me the worst case scenario. Show me, let's look at it to see if I can live with that. If I can live with it, then I'm good. If I can't live with it, then I need to do something else. But we can't just keep on our rose colored glasses and drinking the Kool-Aid and say, well, everything's just gonna be fine. It's happy days are here again. It's just going up. No, what happens if it goes down? Like I say, 30 years, prices have not come back in Japan. You cannot fathom that. They haven't come back. Could it happen here like it's happened here before? I'm saying to you, I think the odds are better than 50-50. Uh, next question for Tilden and John. Uh, we'll start with you, Tilden. Uh, won't the Fed save the day? Do they have any tools to really save this mess? Um, they have some tools, but right now the the Fed made a mistake, in my opinion, and John probably will uh, knows more about this than me. Uh, but the the Fed made a mistake when it decided to lower interest rates um, over just over a year ago. Um, they took a major tool out of their arsenal, which was cutting rates, pumping money back into the economy. Uh, so now they've eased back on quantitative easing. Uh, and uh, so that tool is, is just not there anymore. Um, the legislature could do stuff, but at the end of the day, I'm I'm at a uh, I'm not very good at the national economy uh, like metrics, but to me it does seem to make sense that if you've got a national debt as high as ours, it, it there there is a point where you really do need to stop lending or stop borrowing money um, uh, at some point. And um, so uh, right now we've just tacked on a whole mess of of new debt and. Uh, you know, at some point, the, the price has to get paid. But yeah, John would, will know a lot more about me about it than no, I will. No, I, I, I concur. <laughs> and it's part of the, see, what the, what, the, what the central banks, including the Fed, want you to believe is they are so powerful, they can install a thermostat on the economic wall, and the machines will do all of the work. It'll cool the environment so that you're comfortable, not too cold. It'll warm the environment so that it's not too hot. It'll be the perfect environment. It just doesn't work like that. And part of the reason we are in this conundrum on many levels is because of what the central banks are doing, primarily with making money so cheap for so long. Right now, I see huge numbers of bankruptcies, corporations that will come into uh, the news and uh, you know they'll be very disruptive. And, and so a lot of companies, a lot of individuals, a lot of countries have uh, taken on more debt to try and look like we're the Kardashians, right? And we're all that, no, we're not. Uh, we don't have cash flow driving this thing. We have a lot of debt driving this thing. That, that's not fundamentally strong. 
that actually weakens everything. And at some point, the, 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 there, there will be a homecoming and it, it will not be something that we'll be, we'll be uh, singing about. We won't be doing Kumbaya. I mean, I, I just pulled this up. This is what I got from Harry Dent just yesterday for his August forecast. I think this helps you get the sense of what's really going on here. He says that, you know, Chinese, the Chinese folks typically have 78% of their net worth tied up in real estate. Outside of the US, most people in other countries have more of their assets tied up in real estate than do we. They have very little of their assets tied up in stocks and bonds, like we do. In fact, I think for the US of A, it might be 30% real estate, 70% stock, if we have any assets. And by the way, 50% of us don't have any assets uh, at all, frankly, let alone in real estate or the stock market. All right, so he's talking about Chinese household deal, and he says here, and he says, they will finally lose faith in their super value, empty condos, panicking and selling. No amount of money printing by the central banks will be able to stop that. That's what they want you to believe. They can just print their way out of this and everything's gonna be fine, it's happy days are here again. I don't think so. And one of the reasons that I don't, I don't see that is we have to recognize where we are. Where we are globally, is there more people age 65 and older than five and younger? When's the last time that has happened? Never have you seen that. So like I say, if you stop eating potato chips at 14, stop buying potato chips at 41, who's gonna make you alter your behavior? And let's understand if for whatever reason, like COVID-19, people don't spend and they just keep saving, that stops the economic wheels 100% and the government is not prepared for that. So he says, no amount of money printing by the central banks will be able to stop that, nor will money printing be able to stop the tsunami this Chinese real estate sell-off will cause in real estate around the world, starting in places like Australia and Singapore, spreading into the UK, Canada, and the US. We're not gonna miss this. At some point, the music does stop. We have to get off the, the, the merry-go-round and, and figure out a, a new game, and I, and I think that's, might be the part of the good news that's coming out of this COVID thing, where we're actually paying attention to what's going on, maybe looking at our priorities, maybe recognizing that it's us, like the doctor I find put together so eloquently. You know, we're all in this together, and these folks are on the front line. And by the way, these folks that are on the front line taking the brunt of this COVID-19, they happen to be women and minorities. And, and as I say, remember, the fastest growing ethnic groups in America are led by uh, Asian Americans, numero uno, and uh, Latinos, numero dos. So the rest of us aren't replicating the way we used to. And wait, there's more. The, the birth rate so far this year has fallen off a cliff. It's not changing. It's a whole new ballgame. Okay, next one for you, Tilden. When I inherit my parents' home that is worth now between 700 and 800,000 and Prop 13 is no longer available, what does that mean for property taxes? Uh, it probably means a reassessment uh, in most situations, but it, it can get complicated on exactly why it expired, if it expired because of uh, the two year time period expiring or whatnot. So it's best to talk to talk to an accountant or an attorney that that kind of can look at your exact situation on why that is. You always have the ability at, still to a, appeal your taxes too if it's underwater. So, excellent. Okay, next question uh, for you, John. In Japan, they have declining population gro growth. Here in the U.S., do we have the same issue? Is that why we want to have so much immigration? Would this immigration help to help to mitigate the problem? Excellent question. The answer is correct and yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as I say, the reason we are not following Japan as closely as they have, they, 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 we knew they were going to be number one in gross domestic product, right? That was 88, 89. Their stock market stopped just about New Year's Eve, 1989. Stopped. A year later, their real estate market became unglued. We enjoyed immigration and, and uh, baby boom, they had neither. So um, yeah, we're following Japan uh, just behind them by age. It, and give me that question again, please, Daniel. Which part, John? Well, the, just, okay, go. The whole question? Yeah. 
in, in Japan, they have declining population, population yeah. growth. Okay, thought you could stop there. Yes, we're doing exactly what they're doing. In other words, up until 2008, of two things. One, we were having as many births as we had deaths. And uh, 2008, we were the only country of the developed countries where that was happening, where we had as many deaths as births. Now we have joined the rest of the developed countries where we have more deaths than births. You, I don't care the country, whether you like what's going on or not, for the country to survive, obviously you need people. And, and, and when it comes to, uh, the, let, me, let me say it this way, by analogy, in the state of Maine, we have come to learn, suppose you have family in, in Maine, and suppose they're older and they need health care and they have assets and they have long-term care insurance, which we're gonna be talking about. So, and guess what you, guess what you are hard pressed to find? People to do the work. All the young people, typically immigrants and others, everybody else has moved out of the state of Maine. So I'm saying to you, this is just a precursor of what we're gonna see nationally, where we have the capability of paying good money for good work, but we don't have the people who are there to do the work anymore. That's going to be a problem. So yes, immigrants serve a very, very good purpose. And if we had immigrants, let's say in Maine, to do the jobs the rest of us aren't willing to do for whatever reason, that would that would help us all. And so yes, I I, I say uh, lower the drawbridge, bring in all the immigrants you possibly can. And just notice, I, I would submit to you, notice how we're making it more difficult for the students of other countries who pay full freight to come here and feel comfortable and Canada say, come on, we got room for you, we'll take you, okay? So things change, it just doesn't remain the same. Next question for you, Tilden. Do you feel owning commercial property with businesses closing is something to be concerned with? What advice do you have for these property, elder, property owners on holding on to their properties? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge, huge concern. So I own a few properties myself. Losing a tenant is, uh, is really, really uh, a problem. Um, and I'm not quite sure whether you mean closing in terms of for COVID uh, reasons or closing in general, but really at the end of the day, they're kind of the same thing. Uh, when they're not making money, they're not happy. Um, and so they may be leaving in either case. Um, I think the best thing a landlord can do at this point is whatever you can do to keep the rent coming in and then trying to find new tenants um, and, and try to find a time in the market and decide, you know, is this, is this really a priority? I mean, the problem with real estate, and I'm sure John will agree completely with me, is uh, real estate has a very, very, e it's very easy to become over concentrated in your investment portfolio in real estate because real estate's so expensive. I could buy one share of, of Google and even though I'm sure it's quite high right now, whatever it would be at, it's nowhere near the price that you would be paying for commercial real estate. Um, uh, something goes wrong on that property, you're in big trouble. Something goes wrong in one share that you own of Google, well, but you've got, you know, all these other holdings, big deal, you know, you're, you're it balances out. Uh, so I think over concentration is a big problem. Um, if your portfolio can stand that, then great. Uh, then I don't think it's much of a concern. But if, uh, if you become too concentrated, particularly in one property in one part of the country or you know, one, uh, one product type, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big concern. And I would think about how to diversify better. And, and I yeah, absolutely concur. And I would say, look, folks, as I say, when people think about what to do with real estate, it often takes them two years to process. You do not want to think on this. In an action that uh, we were fortunate enough to sell, by the way, our uh, two attorney friends across the creek on their two and a quarter acres took a year later to get out at 50% less. So as you're thinking about it, things are changing. Sometimes it just makes sense to take the, the fish off the table, get your equity, put it in your pocket. Otherwise you are invested in what this thing does and maybe your portfolio could absorb it, but could you emotionally absorb it? Would, might you have regret? 
Think of it this way. If for any reason, at any time, two days, two minutes, two years, five years from now, whatever it is you have, wherever it is, drops, let's say 30, 40, 50%. I didn't pick those numbers out of the sky. If the real estate values, let's say in, uh, in, in Cleveland drop 13%, that you probably can weather. If the real estate values on the coast drop 40 to 60% and maybe not come back, that might leave you with some regret <laughs> that you die with. That's not my idea of fun. So you can't tell me you didn't see this one coming. Sometimes it just makes sense to take the money off the table as opposed to going, well, it's just got to come back. Says who? Says when? <laughs> okay. But if you look, <laughs> we all know um, Hugh Hefner. Uh, what did he do? So he decided to uh, look at selling the Playboy Mansion. And I have to tell you, to me, this is a great story. He wanted $200 million. He did not get an offer for $200 million, as I understand it. He, his best offer was $100 million. Most of us would go, oh, my God, I can't sell it. Oh, I can't give it away. He gave it away. But let's understand, part of the deal was he would be able to live in the Playboy Mansion until he went to heaven. That's where everybody goes as far as I'm concerned, okay? I'm into that. Now, so I have to imagine if you, what was it, 90-something, I think? You just received $100 million you've never had before. You get to have absolute joy figuring out where to put it. <laughs> that sounds like fun to me. I want to get some here. I want to get some you. I want to put some over there. That's what I want to do. Uh, if it was equity, what could he do with that? He couldn't do anything with it because he didn't have the cash. What do they say? Cash is key. Get the cash. You might have some fun with what you do with the cash. Okay, next question. I'm going to start off with this answer. If I only have my primary residence, I can't sell it because it wouldn't make sense. What do I do? That's really a financial planning question. And a lot of people are kind of in that situation. Sorry if you guys hear the dog in the background. Uh, it's really a financial planning question. So there's a lot of things that we, we would typically look at in that situation. Does it make sense to sell and rent? Does it make sense to look at a reverse mortgage? Does it make sense to buy to sell and move out somewhere else and buy somewhere cheaper? Those, there's a lot of things that can be done in a situation like that, but it's really a, a personal answer. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, uh, I'm not sure what it means I can't sell it. You, there, there's a price on everything. <laughs> But as I say, if you're looking at the value being here in two months or two years from now, it's 40, 50% less than that. Would that be okay? I, there's a price from here to there, but the, the, that future price is probably not what you might be able to get today. But sometimes you just have to be agile, right? To do the deal, both the seller and the buyer have to say, this is a rotten deal. That's how you do the deal. So, as again, look at, look at uh, our friend, uh, the Playboy Mansion guy, he didn't, he didn't stop the transaction because he was only getting 50 cents on the dollar. I can't sell for that. He didn't go there. He didn't whine about it. He took the cash. Okay, last question, and we'll, we'll, we'll close it off. Because of easier movement of people, will we see a change of real estate, of real estate to, to areas of low tax from high tax? Yes. John or Tilden, feel free. Absolutely. We've seen a lot of high net worth individuals go to Florida or uh, other states. Um, so I and I we've seen we're seeing a lot of jobs go. Tesla's working on moving out. Uh, Toyota left a couple of years ago. Um, I think it's uh, it's extremely likely there will be a flight. California's great. I love it here. Um, but I also uh, I have a you know, there's a high tax bill that we pay. Um, and then property taxes, if they change, what, what's the incentive to, for a business to start here? You know, <laughs> it's not like it used to be. <laughs> yeah. and, and we're seeing right now with just this year, particularly the millennials we were talking about a little bit earlier, moved into the city, right? Because they like the diversity and the ability to get about and have food delivered and hang out with their friends. And now uh, we're looking at a lot of vacancies uh, in the big cities commercially and a number of people who are suddenly finding the suburbs to be a good place to go because maybe it's better when events happen as opposed to being you know, right downtown. So the, it's always a moving target. It's just, it, it just keeps changing. That's why I say it's so important to be agile. Excellent. Great answers, guys. And John, what do we got coming up? 
So let's see, have you been thinking about long-term care? If you have, uh, it's a good idea to look at your options. And so we're gonna be focusing on long-term care and looking at the, the newer policies that are available today is for people to, in the old days, if you, you, you would die with it if you didn't use it. So these days, the newer policies, it's either or, either you use it or the money goes to whoever your designate, designee is for a beneficiary. So it's uh, that some of the products that are coming out today, we, we like, some of them we don't, but we want to help people kind of look at that qu equation from the standpoint if I have to go into a long-term care facility, am I the only person involved in paying for that? Am I 100% self-insured? Or, and it's not all or nothing, or it could be, you know, I, I, I hope I don't need it, but let me have $3,000. Let me have $5,000 adjusted for inflation, you know, that might work for 10 years. That, that I might be able to afford, and that certainly might buy me some time. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not trying to, you know, buy a policy where the benefit is $10,000, $12,000 a month and that's the prices for some of the places these days. And by the way, it's a good thing for you to kind of look at some of the facilities long before you need them to see which ones might work within your budget. Because if you wait to the last minute, then you know, it may be the last salesperson who gave you the, the, the price and you, you took it because you, you feel like I didn't have anything else to do. And then speaking of insurance, we'll be looking at annuities. Uh, we like some and we don't like them all. Uh, but for those who want to have a, a guarantee, annuities are hard to beat because they have, uh, that guarantee is independent of whatever the heck the market might do. Now again, it's not all or nothing. Maybe it's appropriate for nothing. Maybe it's a, you know, it might be appropriate for your portfolio, 20%, 30% of your investable assets. But I, we, Certainly, Daniel has seen it over the last 14 years uh, where clients like looking at an account because the guarantees that only goes up. Uh, the market may go down, but the guarantee side goes up and they like knowing that at some point they can get this kind of benefit, you know, kind of like your private social security, if you will, or your private pension, where you have set aside some money to know that this amount, me and my wife or whoever it is in the equation is gonna receive for our life, no matter what the account does in terms of the market side. So again, we like some, there are those that we don't like, but that's why we help uh, evaluate what is your situation, what are you most concerned about, and what kind of things can we do to customize your particular plan so that you can see, you know, let the market do whatever it does, I'm gonna be okay. That, that's what we want more than anything. On that note, uh, you know, the last four months we think uh, are just a setup. In other words, it would not surprise me that uh, we might be at a market top right about here. We will see. Uh, Harry Dip tries to put time into the equation, which is really ambitious. Uh, he feels that uh, the top may be between now and four months from now. As I say, it's not about the prediction, it's all about the preparation. And so for those of you who are on the call, We'll be sending you a little video that lasts all of two minutes. Part two of that is for you to fill in the blanks. Please take the time to do this, to find out probably for the first time, what kind of loss can you accept? See, that's a crucial question because if you find out that the portfolio that you're in was off 42%, as many of them were in 2008, when the market was off 37%, that would be a little excessive if it is the case you've discovered you can live with an 8% loss. So then what Daniel and I will do is try and put together a, another portfolio that we can back test in real numbers. And for one couple, uh, they found out that their account was off 42%. They're planning on retirement and we can't do that again. And say, hallelujah, glad you know that. And they said we can live with an 8% return after they answered these questions. And then we put together a proposal, run it backwards. We find, boy, in 2008, it wasn't off 42, it wasn't off 37, it wasn't off eight, it was off seven. And now they're smiling, and that's my whole point. How can we put things in perspective for you to go let the markets do whatever they do as long as, what would we have, that two point, uh, I was talking about people planning and seeing a total of 2.6. If your number is 2.6 and you're within you know, eight, 10, 15% of that number, no matter what the market might do in retirement, you, you know that you can it, it can, it might come back as, I mean, the numbers are really simple. Well, we'll make them simple. 20%, we need 25 to get back even. 30%, uh, we need 50. If the count's down 40%, now we need 
like over 66% just to get back to even. <laughs> Anybody like those odds? So if we can limit the losses to 20% or less, like I say, we don't need more than 25% to get back to even. That might happen. If we need 100, 150, 160% to get back to even, whew, I don't like those odds. Uh, so let's, uh, let's do what we can to limit the losses. And then they say, keep your account value within the range that you can live with. Let the markets do whatever they do, but you'll be okay financially. So please feel free to schedule a meeting, visit our website, love to meet with you.